You know, you hear these stories about, ooh, I was on the edge of my seat. And really, you're like, okay, I liked it, but I, no, I wasn't on the edge of my seat. The only film that that happened was the first 30 minutes of Raiders. That was a physical, tangible experience to me, where they're shooting arrows and he's running, and I'm looking behind me, and that was crazy to me. My name is Joe Stuber. I'm the creator host of the podcast Comic Book Central. But for the past, I'm going to say, 12 plus years, I've been a member, a proud member of a podcast called The IndieCast. So if you are an Indiana Jones fan, you might be familiar with that podcast. It's at theindiecast.com. And the other gentlemen you see on the panel here today, we have all been a part of that. So I'm just going to go down the line here. To my left is Keith Voss. Keith and I have been producing comic book segments. Uh, so there's a lot of Indiana Jones comic books out there. So we've been producing comic book segments where we review all the comic books. We talk to the comic book creators. We have a lot of interviews. Keith has also done radio drama. So if you're a big fan of radio dramas, listening to those, he's brought those some of those comic books to life. There's some original adventures. There's a two-hour epic adventure radio drama that's out there right now, virtually yesterday. So you want to check that out. So that is Keith Voss. Next to him is Ron Longo. Ron uh, originally started on the podcast, The Indie Cast, as Ron the Reviewer. <laughs> so coming in with a lot of yes. reviews. Uh, but more recently, he has been uh, the co-host, along with Laird Malamed, of the Magic of John Williams special. So if you love John Williams' music, I don't know anybody on the planet that doesn't love John Williams' music. Ron and Laird have been taking a deep dive into that for years now. And of course, on the end, the man behind Terrific Con, the man also behind the Raider.net. When did that start? Uh, 2001. That is a long time to be talking about Indiana Jones. Mitch Halleck, so give it up for the panel, folks. We've been talking about Indiana Jones for so long now. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We are going to be talking about Indiana Jones, our favorite archaeologist adventure. I'm guessing maybe your favorite archaeologist adventure as well. Uh, this is definitely a celebration of Indiana Jones, the films, anything about it, the television show. We, one of the guests at Terrific on here, the great Sean Patrick Flannery, he is here, young Indiana Jones. So if you haven't had a chance to meet him yet, uh, by all means, meet him. So just a little bit of background on the, the IndieCast podcast. It started in 2007 in the lead up to Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and that brought us all together. Uh, for the podcast. So I'm just going to go down the line. Like I said, I jumped in around that. It was like a trivia segment I jumped in on and then started producing the, the comic book segment. So I'm just going to go down the line and everybody just sort of tell how you jumped into the podcast and uh, what you've been able to do over the past, oh my God, like since 2007. Yeah, so go ahead. All right. So yeah, I, I also, uh, around the time of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I was just devouring everything Indiana Jones at the time. Like, like we didn't know if we were going to get another movie after that, or I mean, it's been so long since we had an Indiana Jones movie. So I you know, started looking online, found the IndieCast, um, and again, you know, started listening to the episodes. Heard that there was a trivia segment, and I love trivia. So I started writing in and writing to the host, and then writing to the to the person in charge of the trivia segment at the time. The host, 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 host Ed Dollista uh, from Australia, who, who was just here not too long ago. Two or three. Um, so I was writing in, writing to Ed, writing to the, the to, to to the trivia segment, and just got started getting very involved and started doing a lot of writing uh, with my answers. And then uh, through the trivia, it started to become a little bit of a competition. We started this like sort of little club, the the, the trivia brotherhood. And so you'd have to kind of beat certain people to the punch. To, to, to answers, and um, that's kind of when Joe got involved, and you know we were kind of competing against each other quite a bit, and you know, he hated me. He hated me. Uh, I was always I was always beating him to the punch. So um, yeah, then eventually Joe and I got pretty close. We'd try to figure out some answers together, stuff like that. Uh, realized we were. We were working well together. We 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 loved this character so much. We were talking about everything, the comics. Um, yeah, all kinds of things. And so as we were having some chats, we, we, we did the Seinfeld thing. We were like, this should be the show. This should be a segment. And so we were just talking about comics and how much we loved that Marvel series back in the 80s. Not everybody loved it, but we, we loved it. it. It captured the pulpiness of, of what George Lucas was trying to achieve with Raiders. And we, we absolutely devoured it, loved it, started talking about it, and said, hey, we should, 
we should share this passion uh, with these comics. Maybe a lot of fans don't even know these comics exist, some of the newer fans, and you know, what a good time to do that. And um, how many how many segments now? A hundred? About a hundred? For over twelve years. Yeah, over twelve years. Interviewed a lot of the creators. Stan Lee uh, has has contributed uh, the opening greeting to our segment. We have a lot of people that have uh, artists, uh, inkers, writers have. Uh, we've interviewed them all, uh, more or less. And yeah, we we're quite happy doing that. And it's just led to. Uh, amazing friendships with all of these guys up here and, and, and other indie casters. You know, like, like Mitch said earlier, we're from all over the world. It's, it, like the, the love of this character has, uh, has brought us all together. And even to a point where we're coming to Mitch's uh, Terrificon just to celebrate it. So, yeah, it's been, it's been an adventure. So uh, we're, we're very happy to, uh, to be part of it. Yeah, so uh, kind of like uh, Keith here... Uh, until podcasts came around, I thought I was the biggest Indiana Jones fan in the world. And, um, and then all of a sudden, The King of the Crystal Skull came out, and I discovered podcasts. And I found the IndieCast, and I started listening to it. And obviously, Mitch, with Ed Dollister, was one of the first ones. And I was just enthralled. I downloaded all the episodes, I listened, and I just knew that I wanted to be a part of it. I, ne I needed an outlet for Indiana Jones. Because uh, it was just a very special hero to me when I was younger, and got me through a lot. So uh, I started writing in, and then um, Ed started reading my letters, and I said, you know, let me record a little couple segments. So I kind of reinvented myself probably about three or four times on the IndieCast. <laughs> um, I started out as Ron the Reviewer. Uh, <laughs> I just started out, anything that came out in Indiana Jones, I was reviewing. Um, and I used to give it, uh, I had a scale, the Shankara Stones. Everybody saw Indiana Jones the Temple of Doom, so I would give it five out of five Shankara Stones, five being the best. Five, five being the best. Uh, the best. Uh, so I did the Ron the Reviewer for a long time, um, started doing a little trivia stuff here and there, and then what happened is, uh, it was John Williams' birthday, and I said, you know, I love John Williams, I'm sure everybody does. I, I said, let me celebrate his birthday. So what I did is, I recorded about four or five of my favorite uh, you know, uh, tracks that he's done, and I posted it. Well, unbeknownst to me, Laird Malamed, who is part of the IndieCast, he was here a couple years ago. Um, Laird used to work for Lucasfilm. Um, I call him uh, the musical guru, but uh, Laird took my um, recordings and put them in stereo, and then, Sound editor for Young Indiana Jones, uh, Laird was also, I should say that. Um, but he, we both hooked up, we both loved uh, John Williams, and we started doing John Williams specials as an offset of the IndieCast. And it got really successful. We've had some amazing guests. Anna Sofa Mooter, um, the violinist, has joined us. Uh, we've had Mike Mattesino. Uh, Mike works with John Williams all the time, um, re doing all the, you, you see these new re-recordings and um, extended soundtracks coming out of late for John Williams. Mike has uh, worked on that. We've had Keith Lockhart, Gloria Chang. Um, so we've had a lot of great guests on. And what we do is we talk about Indiana Jones and we also talk about some of his other movies. And I also do a trivia segment. So uh, we do that every week. And then I got to meet these great people. Um, just like Keith said, you know, Keith lives in Austria. I'm in New Jersey. Um, you know, Joe is in Ohio, and we all know where Mitch is. So uh, yeah. it's been it's been a really great ride. And speaking of Mitch, Mitch, how did you get involved? And it was actually coming in off the Radar.net too, right? Yeah, I'm also running a convention at the same time. So if you see me, I'm not being. <laughs> if you rude, see his phone blowing up, you'll my know wife's what it is. like, you know, what, 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 Sean Gunn needs this. I'm like, oh, anyway. Uh, oh yeah. So I'm Mitch Halleck, from born in New Haven, Connecticut. Anybody from Connecticut out here? Thank you. So, in 2007, I'm in New Haven, where I was born and grew up, and I used to say all the time on the streets of New Haven, God, nothing has ever changed in this town. You could film a movie set in the 50s, and nothing has to be changed. It looks exactly, what a dull town. I used to say this as I'd get the bus and go to the movies to see things like Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones, and the Temple of Doom, it was just the way I grew up. My comic shop was there. Everything was there. So, one day, I'm on Chapel, and my buddy goes, hey, there's some type of movie company downstairs. They rented some offices. Uh, you should go try out, because he knows I like movies. I go, yeah, whatever. What's the movie called? I don't know. It's called Genre Productions. G-E-N-R-E. -E. I go, what, what, what is that? I don't know. It's all, they got paper all over the windows. You can't see anything. 
couple months earlier, Steven Spielberg was in town with Kate Capshaw, and they were visiting their son, Theo, who was at Yale University. So they went to the pizza restaurant. They came out. Spielberg was walking down Chapel Street. And my friend saw, saw him. And Spielberg's doing this. The director fingers. Yeah. I didn't, and people are like, what was that all about? And it's going to make sense because the place he was doing this is going to end up in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. The exact place that he was seen doing this, it's in the movie. So, genre productions, it leaks out. It's really the next Indiana Jones movie. So, you know my head exploded. I'm like, what? They're coming here? It's like Luke Skywalker. Nothing good ever comes to New Haven. What are you talking about? And if you're from around here, you know that. And we can say that because I'm from there, so don't give me any crap. So anyway, so the whole idea that George Lucas, Harrison Ford, Steven Spielberg are coming to the place that I grew up and go to the movies. I'm like, oh my God, I got to be in that movie. So they had an open casting call. I ran down there. If you ever want to be in a movie that you're a fan of, don't wear all the stuff because they'll call security. So what happened is I show up with my little pin that says Indiana Jones and I'm all, and my dog, God rest his soul, his name was Indiana. Yes, we named the dog Indiana. So anyway. dog? (laughs) So I go down there and there's thousands of people and I'm like, oh my God. And I get there, I love Indiana Jones. I know everything about him. His name is Henry Walton Jones Jr. He was born July, and they go, nutcase, nutcase. I didn't get the part. But my friends Shocking. My friends got in the movie. But what I did do is I started walking around New Haven and I started taking pictures of all the buildings that they were remaking to be Indiana Jones. And next thing you know, there was a thing called... Oh! (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Patrick Flannery. If I got to get stepped on by somebody, it would be <laughs> Sean Flannery. Well, real quick, I'll cut to the end of the story. I'm writing for a thing called the Raider.net. It was a website. It was all about Indiana Jones. It was about Temple of Doom, Crystal Skull, even the young Indiana Jones. And I used to write articles about it. And then I started taking pictures of all the sets in New Haven and all the stuff that was going on. The stuntmen, the actors. One day I walked around a corner and there was Steven Spielberg and Harrison Ford leaning against a tree just drinking water, talking about the next scene. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like from here to there. This is insane. And I take my camera out and I'm taking pictures of them. And when you develop the pictures, you realize behind Steven Spielberg, there's this mountain of a man like Pat Roach, who's like six foot six and he's like, and he's pointing at me, but I was too busy looking at Ford and Spielberg going, next, they're tapping me on the shoulder. Yeah, can we talk to you? Who? Oh, me? Then I realized everybody around me is dressed like they're from the 50s, and I'm in a Jaws t-shirt and khaki shorts. Whatever that is. So anyway, they go, are you Mitch? I go, oh, jeez. How do they, I don't have, are you writing stuff for the Raider.net? Maybe. We want to talk to you. I'm not getting paid. We don't care. So what happened is they were reading all my articles and all the pictures that I was taking on the set, and they were like, could you not spoil the movie? I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. I, I won't do it. Don't tell George Lucas and everything. And they're just like, okay, fine. Meanwhile, in Australia, there's this guy named Ed Dollister who's about to do a podcast, and he's reading articles from the Raider.net on the IndieCast, and I'm listening to it going, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Wait, I wrote that stuff. What the hell? So I wrote him a letter going, Hey, buddy, I wrote that stuff. And he's like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. So I was writing the articles that Ed was reading for a while. And then he goes, why don't you just come on? I go, how do you do a podcast? He goes, you just get a microphone. Dude, I had no idea what was going on. And if you ever listen to the IndyCast for the first year, my microphone was going like this. So anyway, called I don't thumper. know. And they were going, they, called they used to thumper. call me Thumper <laughs> because it was so bad. So anyway, that was 17 years ago. Long story short. We started the IndyCast, these guys all came on, and it let us meet all kind of cool people from Karen Allen to Harrison Ford to Kihi Kwan, short round himself, who was my first guest here at Mohegan Sun back in 2015. Now he's Academy Award winning actor, 
key Kwan, and it's a cool thing, and it's been great, and it lets us come out and meet people like you, and bring great people like Mr. Sean Patrick Flannery, who's now going to talk. What are you going to say, Sean? No. Sean is not a member oh. of the IndyCast, although he has been, been on, on the lot, IndyCast yeah. quite a few times. We've talked, had a chance to interview you and had been on the IndyCast. If you didn't, weren't aware of that, you are now. <laughs> so, but we were talking about how we got involved in the IndyCast. Gee, Sean Patrick Flannery, how did you get involved in the world of Indiana Jones? Uh, there was an audition. <laughs> that there was a .0001 possibility of me getting it. So I crushed the audition. Yes. <laughs> because you realize there's no way I could possibly ever be hired by George Lucas to do Indiana Jones. No, I'm not kidding. The easiest audition of my life, only because I thought there was no possible way this could happen. As soon as you start going to a callback, and then a second callback, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, you go, oh shit, I could get this. And your auditions start, well, sucking. Um, miraculously, I got the part anyway. And the next thing I know, I, I was on a plane to go to London and being taught how to ride uh, a horse by Harrison's stunt double, the famous Vic Armstrong. Uh, and the horse was Hurricane, uh, Harrison's horse and Raiders, and uh, the rest is history. I mean, I mean e everything I've done in this industry is because the door was opened by young Indiana Jones. I spent, you know, five years out of the country filming that, and it was. 20 years of film school condensed into those five. Uh, it was 30 years of industry relationships condensed into five. Um, and it gave me access to every other film I've had the honor to be a part of. It, re it really, it was, a, it was a great inauguration into the film business, it was. And uh, to, to be, to have your hand held by the likes of those names kind of it's beyond surreal, you know. I, I'll tell you the first, the, the entire first year of filming, I thought I was going to be fired. I thought certainly they're going to realize that. I mean, I mean, on the call sheet, a call sheet is the sheet you get the day before of filming, and it tells you all the cast members that are going to play, what scenes they're going to play, and you know, there's names like you know Vanessa Redgrave, Christopher Lee, Elizabeth Hurley, Sean Patrick. <laughs> who is that guy? You know, it was I. I was amongst established actors and it wasn't lost on me so I, I always thought that they were gonna figure out this is just some dude from Texas who'd never done anything before and I was gonna show up and they were gonna give me my walking papers it didn't happen but uh, isn't that the actor's curse though that you always think like I mean Jonathan Frakes has said it and everybody's like you always think that's gonna be their last thing or it's always gonna end like tomorrow and you just never expect anything and I think that's I think that comes across too in, in just realizing that you can just be free and loose and just go for it no, I don't. <laughs> in a word. Uh, initially, it does. Yeah. But, but, you know, li like in any job, you, you, you get to a place where you go, I've established so much value, they can't afford to fire me. Or they'd yeah. be stupid. Or even if I do, I'll get another job. I, you know, that, that's what confidence is. But early on on the stage, I didn't have that confidence. But confidence comes in any aspect, whether it's athletics, whether it's a job. Once you realize that everybody is aware that they're paying you two dollars and getting four dollars of value absolutely no you're wrong you know that you have a place and if they choose to let you go you will find you will land on your feet but right then i did not yeah initially you're, you're correct but yeah that was early early on too yeah, yeah so yeah it was but we do have a microphone over here so if you folks have any questions for anybody if you want to talk about your love of indiana jones the character your favorite friend, whatever you or, want to or talk your about. hate of indiana jones <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be a hater in here somewhere no this is a celebration of indiana jones we're gonna do so if there's a microphone over there if you want to just jump on the mic we can take some audience questions too um but for young indiana jones 28 episodes uh, over two seasons, and I think four uh, four films that they ended up creating, and now of course they got the DVDs and it's streaming now too. So uh, there's so many different ways to watch this. And uh, again, we just want to even mention, I want to kind of go down the line too and just talk about what attracted you to the character into the first into the first place. So Sean, we just maybe even talk to you. Like, were you a fan going in? Let me just answer that with one word: duh. <laughs> it's it's. Indiana Jones. That that I, I don't know of anybody in Hollywood that l l honestly. You tell me. Do you think there's any young male actor in Hollywood that would again? Yeah, not for me. I mean, <laughs> unless you're Tom Cruise and you're doing, you know, Top Gun. You, uh, of course. I mean, it, it's. I mean, obviously, yeah. everybody that I knew 
when that came out, it was, that's why the audition was so easy, because I, got, I thought, certainly they're going to find an A-list established actor, and it, that gives you the freedom to really be creative, and some of my best auditions are the ones where I thought I didn't have a chance, but what brought me to it? It's like saying, you know, you stumble upon a pile of 24 pounds of gold. What made you want to keep it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Did you recall your first in, uh, first experience seeing? Because I remember, like, we, I went in cold, not knowing. I just knew it was Han Solo, and it was the guy that did Star Wars. And it's like, all of a sudden, I saw the boulder rolling for the first time. And as a 14-year-old kid, my brain just went, I, I haven't seen that before. What did I just see? And then I can't wait to see it again. We literally just went to the next showing. Right? You, you, you know, thir, thir, well, thir, the first 30 minutes of Raiders, I, I think, you know, like a lot of y'all, was the most different cinematic experience I've ever had in my life. Yeah. I've never seen a film with that big of a separation or jump in excitement. You know, you hear these stories about, ooh, I was on the edge of my seat. And really, you're like, okay, I liked it, but I, no, I wasn't on the edge of my seat. The only film that that happened was the first 30 minutes of Raiders. That was a physical, tangible experience to me, where they're shooting arrows and he's running, and I'm looking behind me, and that was crazy to me. It was, it was sensory overwhelming, and I'd never seen a film with that kind of physical reaction before. So then having the opportunity to, to go and play that guy was beyond bizarre. It, 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 it seemed, the possibility was infinitesimally small. But yes, that, that was, that was a life-changing experience. Yeah. Just being in the theater, after paying way back then, for probably five bucks to see the movie. Yeah. But the opening 30 minutes changed the way that I looked at action movies completely. Yeah. And not very much has matched that even since. Agreed. The first 30 minutes of that is something that is all, I, I push to say unparalleled. Yeah. You felt like you saw something. Maybe we get some. Uh, let's take a quick audience question. Yeah, you can just, that mic will come down. Yeah, you can just point it right down to you. The other way, or if you hold it like David there you Roth. Go. <laughs> okay. What's your name? My name is George. Hey George. Whoa, George. That's loud. Okay. Um, my question is for Mr. Hey you. Hey you. You can call me Hey you, Mr. Hey you. So. That's all right. Flannery. Hey. Uh, Connery. That's right or not. This is a very loud. Shane <laughs> sure, um, Connery's here. So my question is, were you nervous going in for the audition? And how many people did you think were there? So... Were going to be there? And then when you actually got there, how off were you? Okay, so I'll tell you this. So we talked about this a little. This is a, an interesting, you know, psychological experiment for me. The, the initial audition, in, in, the, in the acting industry, there's what you call a cattle call. If you, you do any farming or ranching, you know, your dog comes out, all the cows come in. Every single cow on the property comes in. Well, a cattle call is one of those auditions where they just say, hey, if you have a pulse and you're male and you're between these ages, come in and read for the part. And you're not even reading for the casting director. You're reading for the casting director's assistant's assistant's assistant. And then if you make it past that, then you read for the casting director's assistant assistant. Then if you make it past that, you read for the casting director's assistant, which is a pretty big deal. If you make it past that, you read for the casting director. And then you do a callback for the casting director and the producer. Then you do a screen test for the casting director, the producer, and the director, and George Lucas. I I'm not kidding, it's that involved. So the first one, I realized, it was a guy. It was a guy about my age that didn't even know how to work the video camera. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't nervous at all. I'm like, dude, I'm smarter than you. I've been in. I, you know, I, I. It was just. It's different. You know what I mean? Then the second one, not too dissimilar. The third one, I wasn't nervous at all because I was still five orders of magnitude away from actually getting the part. By the time we did a screen test, it was me and three other guys. And that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. Did I have a 25% shot at playing Indiana Jones? Which, to, to, to this day, it's still the biggest thing I've ever done. I've never worked for George Lucas or Spielberg or, or anywhere close to that size of monumental star in the industry ever again. So 
And, and now I have a decent established body of work and I'd still be nervous if I had read to read for Georgia. But back then I'd, I've never done anything, nothing. I'd done three commercials, a Milk Does a Body Good, a Kellogg's Corn Pops uh, with Paul Walker. He was both, he and I both, both first job and a Burger King commercial. And then I did two serials for the Disney Channel, the Mickey Mouse Club, where you do this 50 minute movie and they air about seven minutes per episode. That's it, it's all I'd ever done. So I didn't get nervous until I realized there was a possibility of me getting it. And an interesting, interesting metaphor for life. If you can compartmentalize those pressures, and I tell you, that is a wonderful way to navigate yourself. You don't change. The situation doesn't change. The perception of the situation changes. And that affected my performance. And I can honestly say my first audition was probably my best, and the screen test was probably my worst. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll give you an analogy. It's the same job, the same job. You ever watch the Olympics and watch the gymnastics? Yeah. Okay, you know how they have that balance beam? You know, these girls are doing, Nadia Comaneci, I think was the first, yes, like that. The first perfect 10. She was doing double gainers and landing on her feet and double backflips. Here's the thing. There's only a certain cross section of, of the population that has no fear of heights. If you took Nadia Comaneci and you elevated that balance beam a thousand feet in the air, I guarantee you she couldn't even walk across it. It's mental, right? You could take somebody without the fear of heights, and if it was a thousand feet in the air, they would beat Nadia Comaneci. Does that make sense? It's not your skill, it's how you compartmentalize the pressures that allow you to access your skill. That makes a lot of sense. And well, that, 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 was, that was illustrated to me on my first audition. I was the best when it didn't count, and I was the worst when it did. And it forced me to look at it from an outside and analyze it and work on myself. I couldn't have that happen again. The next time I went into a room of high-level executives, I had to be able to perform as if they couldn't offer me anything. Does that make sense? And I've always been very, very grateful for those rooms, but I want to prepare for those rooms. I hope that makes sense to you. That Good insight. Thanks so much sense. for the question, too. I want to go down the line real quick. Uh, Keith, Ron, and Mitch, uh, what first drew you to the character? Do you remember your just first memory seeing it, and what drew you to Indiana Jones? Uh, yeah, well, my first memory seeing it was uh, I grew up in Jersey City, and one of my neighbors, a friend of mine, his dad got the VHS tape of Raiders and asked my dad, said, hey, we got Raiders. You guys want to come over and watch it? And said, what's Raiders? What is that? Um, yeah, sure, we'll come on over. We popped it in. So this was a VHS tape. And I don't know if you guys remember, or if anybody saw that, that same VHS tape, but um, there was a, a small teaser for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom before that. And that was my first um, experience with the character. And that, blew, that, that teaser blew my mind, which also kind of got me a little uh, interested in editing. Uh, which uh, later on in my life I edited movie trailers and so on before I moved overseas. Black Belt movie editor. He edited trailers for 90% of the top 10 movies you've ever seen in your life. Don't yeah. let him undersell that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was quite an experience. So um, Temple of Doom, my, my favorite Indiana Jones movie, that was my first experience with Indiana Jones, that little teaser. Um, you guys remember the one in Macau and like yeah. you know, all the Sri Lanka and it, it's it's the plane that's flying through and exactly yeah. and I was like okay this looks interesting and then the movie started and anything then the movie started <laughs> and yeah it just blew my mind and for the longest time I couldn't even I couldn't even watch that ending once uh, you know, once Toad's face melts. I, I, it scared me to death. Um, but yeah, that movie just changed everything. Adventure, excitement. Um, uh, it's Han Solo, but what's going on here? The, the, the different character? I think I like this character a little bit better, actually. Different, but equally, but as, equally cool. as cool. Which is crazy, right? right? It is. So, um, you know, he was going off to exotic places, and you know, he was with beautiful women, and um, he was a smart guy. He was almost a secret agent. He's the American James Bond. Um, 
so that that's that's what got me interested and I watched that thing over and over and over again and uh, got the action figures got all the toys went on adventures with my Indiana Jones figures um, I mean yeah that movie changed everything for me um, there's only a few there's a handful of films of uh, in my life that influenced me to uh, say how did that film get made not just like you enjoy it, you sit back as 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 a viewer as a movie lover and say wow that really that's an amazing film but like how did they make it? Um, when the music hits, I feel a certain way. When, uh, when I see the character do something uh, in particular, it makes me feel a certain way. Uh, so it was about the technique of editing and the, the technique of music placement. We talked about this yesterday pretty much most of the day. Um, so that got me interested in, in the technique and, and aspects of filmmaking. So it was a movie like Time Bandits and, and movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Temple of Doom, Star Wars, of course, all that, all that was uh, very influential in, in my life. So, it, I mean, that video cassette of Raiders, that's what did it. Started it all. Ron, your first experience? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think what drew me to the hero, I, you were talking about that earlier, was at the time when I was a kid, you know, your heroes were Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. And, you know, there are outer space adventures, special effects, but when Indiana Jones came out and Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think that's the first time that I saw, this is just a human being. This is a hero with flaws, because he does have flaws. Um, he has ups, he has downs, um, but he's an archeologist. If I want to go to school and be an archeologist, I can be an archeologist. He has adventures, and it just drew me in because I actually, it was very relatable to me. Because by then, you're you know, a kid at your age, you're looking at Superman and Han Solo, like I mentioned before. Um, and another thing that I really enjoyed is the effects. Everything was so practical back then. Unfortunately, now as we're, you know, we get a, little, a lot of CGI, but seeing that movie and the stunts uh, were just absolutely amazing. And you know, you, there was no green screen. It was, it was great. As a matter of fact, I don't know if everybody remembers, but a little after Raiders of the Lost came, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark came out. There was a the stunts of Raiders of the Lost Ark. They put it on television, yep. and it was absolutely phenomenal. I, I owned that VHS tape. I was watching it, and just seeing how hard they had to work to really make the audience happy and have something tangible, something that we can relate to, um, really made me a fan of it. And seeing it for the first time with my father, God bless him, but my dad took me to see it, and I. Uh, Boy, I tell you, it was great. But I, I will tell you something funny, though. You mentioned the having the VHS tape. I live in New Jersey, really close to Philadelphia. And uh, we were the first ones to have Raiders of the Lost Ark on a VHS tape. Uh, my dad said it fell off the back of a truck. And every kid in my neighborhood came to my house, and we watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. The copy was a little, you know, somebody was in the back taping it. but uh, And we watched it over and over and over. And we, I just loved the character. And, you know, it drew me in. And you said Temple of Doom. And Temple of Doom is another great. You know, everybody remember, Temple of Doom is a prequel to Indiana Jones. So if you kind of look at Temple of Doom, you kind of see his growth a little bit, which I really liked how what Spielberg did on that one. And see how he comes full around. You know, in Temple of Doom, remember, he cares about fortune and glory. All he wants to do is the treasure, but at the end he realizes he's saving the village and all, and then that brings you in the Raiders and it makes really good sense to me, but that's really what brought me in the hero, to that hero. Cool. And then uh, uh, mention them, we'll take some audience questions. Well, there was a, uh, a newsletter, I was part of the Star Wars fan club, and it was called <laughs> Bantha Tracks. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that, but you'd get this newsletter in the mail, there's no internet, and Empire Strikes Back had come out. We're all waiting for the next chapter, Revenge of the Jedi, before they changed it. And there was a little tiny blurb in the back of one of those issues. And it had a drawing by an artist that I knew named Jim Steranko. And it looked like Humphrey Bogart standing in a desert. And I'm like, what is this movie? And it says, coming next summer, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I just stared at that picture of this Humphrey Bogart-like guy in a desert with like guys on camels and guns and it made no sense whatsoever it looked nothing like Star Wars and then I'm like okay when that comes out I'm gonna see it so early June they used to have sneak previews of movies years ago and they would do a double feature and on that Friday like early June before Raiders opens playing with a new Richard Pryor movie called Bustin' Loose I don't know who picked these movies <laughs> You could go at Friday and you get two movies for the price of one and this brand new movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I said, my dad, can you, can you take me? Because I got to work. I was like 12. I couldn't drive. So I begged my old Italian grandmother to take me to the movies to see this on a Friday night. It was a Richard Pryor movie. And she's like, what are we doing here? I'm like, I don't know. So Raiders comes on. 
It's not in space. There's no Star Wars. I'm like, what's going on here? And then like Sean said earlier, what what's happening? And it's on the screen. And the whole nobody in the audience knew what to expect either. But it was sold out. We're all like, oh. and you could hear a pin drop. And then you start to hear people start to laugh. When you know, some people, the, the spiders are on him and he's hugging Indy and all that, and there's some sense of humor, but then there's some trepidation too. And then the spikes come out, and like, you go first if you insist, and you are, you know, and is this a comedy? What's going on here? And it's like, you, you, I got chills thinking about it, but everybody was instantaneously into that movie. And then he's running over the hill, screaming to Jock, and there's one guy, and then there's like 50 guys chasing behind him. Everyone's like laughing and cheering and all that. And I mean, I don't know what this is, but I love this, you know? And then he gets in the plane and what's there? Oh, that's just my pet snake, Reggie. Now, my grandmother, God rest her soul, had a fear of snakes like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and she's like, Ugh! and she hits me like that. I'm like, ow. And she's like, oh my God. Ah. And she's swearing in Italian at me. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> calm down, Graham. Calm down. So the movie's fine. We're all good. She's like, what kind of movie did you take me to? I go, I don't know, Graham. Then the well of the souls happens with thousands of snakes. My poor grandmother ran out of that theater <laughs> screaming, ah! And I'm like, moral dilemma. Do I go after my grandma? But this is the best part. <laughs> She'll be okay. So I sat there, and I look in the back of the theater, and they used to have these little round windows. And my grandmother was like four foot 11. And I see this little head sticking up like that watching the movie. She showed up about 20 minutes later when they were at the Flying Wing. She goes, I'll never take your seat in movies again. This is a terrible movie. I'm like, can we go see it? Net tomorrow when it opens and she, what so that was my first experience and the reason why I love Indiana Jones and my father loves it I got an F in religion class in Catholic school you know how bad that is I got an F in history I was a terrible student but when I started watching Raiders I go hey the Ark of the Covenant that's what Mr. Parkinson talked about in religious class suddenly I got into that and I got my F to an A my history class went from F to an A so if it wasn't for Indy I probably would have got a lot more beatings from my dad <laughs> for paying all that money for Catholic school, and I was flunking out. But thank you, Indiana Jones, and you know and we probably wouldn't so have had a Terrificon either. And I we wouldn't have been. Did. If no, you ever noticed, the Terrificon logo is looks a lot like the Raiders of the Lost Ark <laughs> logo too. So it's, it's influenced me. So that's my my Indiana Jones intro story right there. Well, I think too it was like we we weren't used to that. Spielberg and Lucas were used to this was their homage. I mean, Star Wars was the homage to Buck Rogers, and this was the homage to the 30s and 40s era. But we hadn't seen that yet, so it was something new to all of us. Let's take a few audience questions. You got to, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can only Matt. imagine it was now. Be, Matt, Matt and I met Indiana each other. Indiana Jones on the, himself. We met on the set of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Yes, we sir. were both volunteering for that show. Yes, never got to meet Harrison Ford, unfortunately. You can, but I got you to can meet move Shia. Mike yeah, yeah, that, that was for George, but you can. Look. I got to meet uh, Shia LaBeouf on set, That's so right. that was the closest I got, and about a little bit further from where. That speaker is right over there. Harrison and uh, Stephen were yep. that far from me. It was, it was mind blowing. It was Saturday too. I remember. That. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One day on the set, they told us, "Don't talk to the, to the, to yeah, the don't, don't, don't talk to those people." Yeah, yeah. Don't make eye contact. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was the greatest day of my life, Mitch, and just being able to see Hollywood magic like that being made. The, uh, you know, the smoke effects. Oh yeah, And crazy. then um, last year. I ended up being able to go to that area where they filmed where uh, uh, the Russians crash into the statue of Marcus. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, I'm reliving 2008 again. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. It comes back like yeah. that. I, I, yeah. So um, the question I have is for both Mitch and for uh, Sean. Um, what do you guys think of where the Indiana Jones franchise is going to be heading now that Indy 5 is done. Are we going to get a spinoff? I thought he was going to be in the last movie. I swear to God. I thought they were going to do a flashback sequence and it was going to end up with this guy <laughs> and it was back in the 50s and then when we're at the premiere. I got to go to the premiere with Lucas and Spielberg and Harry. We're all in Los Angeles and the movie's over and I was like, where the hell's Flannery? Oh, I'm sorry if you didn't see the movie. We all said that. But anyway, I really I thought, I I really that, thought because at your age now, I get a chance you to could ask pick you it right up, and it would be in the 50s and stuff, and you could, and you're still in good shape, and you could do it. Excellent shape. And why, 
Why, why, I literally thought he was gonna, maybe it might happen. We don't. You know. told me you'd sign up at a New York Minute for like. No, uh, nobody tells George Lucas. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I get exactly. social media messages. If you know, if w- w- would you do it if they it, like? Are, are you shitting me? Yeah. <laughs> what, I made a career out of making movies that nobody sees. What are you, <laughs> just, yes, of course, man. Uh, I have no idea where they're gonna go. You know, like. It, 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 it's it's such a like you you perfectly illustrated it the, the the difference in in a cinematic experience even people that aren't movie buffs that was a different it, it, it's you know you, you you look at some bands like what what was what was in the air when the Beatles came together yeah that songwriting pair there was some kind of magic same thing in Raiders I mean the score the editing the directing the acting the writing it's so rare when all of the moving parts come together and out of a one to ten they're tens they're not nines they're not eight fives they're tens mm-hmm. it's just rare it's lightning in a bottle and I don't know where it goes I, I, I hope for me that uh, it doesn't get watered down or tarnished and they don't just try to like make it to make it sake because uh, um, th- th- those original Raiders moments and you know the Temple of Doom and uh, it, it, it's it's all there's so many moments that are priceless if they can bottle that and put it out I will be the first person with 25 bucks because that's like what a ticket is now right yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, I went to New York it was 30 I was like God yeah, yeah. I took it's my 30 bucks matinee at four o'clock we went for my birthday I looked at the ticket I go thirty dollars oh, one ticket. One ticket. What's a popcorn? Like it was a, oh, the popcorn was cheap. The popcorn was like five bucks. But we went to the IMAX on Columbus Circle. But I was like thirty dollars. Wow. What are they gonna do? Make me like hang out with Indy on the screen or something? Yeah. Swing on I, a I, rope. I, I, I don't know where it goes, but I, but I hope they try to try to come close to that. You know, you, you you're never gonna match it. But my God, I mean, now if a movie is a seven, people are singing from the rafters. You know. Uh, Honestly, can you tell me a film that has matched the first 30 minutes of Raiders? I can't. Yeah. I can't. No. You know, um, it, it, it's, I, I hope they try to preserve that. I hope, I hope for they, they look for that recipe. I hope they look back at why it was successful and try and put those moving pieces back into it. Because I'm, at my core, I'm a fan. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I was that dude. I, well, here's a quick, I got a quick question the for you. Should they have just set all the movies just in a, a 30s? Early '40s era, and don't touch it. Don't don't try to bring them into the '50s. Don't try to bring them into the '60s. Just keep India in that little magic pre World War II mystical when the world was still you know young and they, they didn't have technologies and or you know is that where they should keep the character? Is that his sweet spot? Early '30s. You know, to me, it's like uh, you know your grandma putting on a miniskirt. You know what I mean? The, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're a different place. It's, it's like your dad putting a Speedo on. He's 75. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like you're at a different time. It's like th- some, sometimes, you know, there, there, there's this inter- interesting intersection where you're hard-pressed to find anything that's remade that lives up to the original. You know, there, there's a, the, the current era of thought that needs to see it, hear it, and understand it. There's the political climate, the social climate that makes it work in that moment. And it just shows a lack of creativity to keep going back. To, it, it, it's almost like they, they, there's not an original thought. So they just, okay, what, what else was successful in the 80s, and the 70s? Was bring that back to life. And it's always a laughable version of what it wants. It almost tarnishes it. Yeah. Um, and, and there's some amazing writers out there. It's kind of crazy. It, it, it's Hollywood has become so such a business machine, they hedge their bets. Instead of taking a chance on some writer, but that, that's what George Lucas was. He was a writer that's like, I got this thing called Star Wars after physical graffiti. And they're like, somebody said, wow, yeah. And look what he did. You know, he wasn't a, he wasn't a huge name back then, but there, there's some amazing stories out there if you look closely. Instead of going back to the well and trying to you know, add elements and change it. And, you know, there's a reason that it was successful. And it was the time, it's a mm. current era of thought, amongst other things. Yeah. So, so you talked about this on the show a little bit, that 
we we've talked about this on the, is the fact that a lot of the feature film stuff now is be, the epicness of that we see they're not underperforming at the box office. A lot of that's moving over to streaming services. We see a lot of epic like you think about Mandalorian. The the toys look better, so they get those things. So I know we've mentioned before that there was a thought of maybe. Uh, a streaming series maybe on Disney Plus for Ravenwood, Abner Ravenwood. I don't know that uh, that's going to happen. We've talked about, you know, could there possibly be an animated series uh, that they could do something like that. I think even in the new movie, uh, you have the Phoebe Waller-Bridge character that's in there. So that seemed to be maybe trying to set up something that may go to a streaming platform. But the key is supporting the character, supporting that franchise, because if the dollars are there, if the audience is there, if everybody's liking these things and do want, as Mitch said, maybe putting it back into the 30s and maybe getting some of those adventures earlier, like how did, you know, we have the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles and it's like maybe right after that, some of those adventures. So it's really supporting that, that character and coming through for that from the audience level. So go see the movie a bunch of times by yeah, the yeah. 4K when it comes but, but, out. But before we wrap up, because we got to get going, he's got to get back to his table, do some autographs and photos. I got to ask Sean, I don't know if it's ever come up, but I love the show so much, but I always love the chemistry of you and Remy. How was it like to work with Quartier before he passed away? I mean, you, was he a great guy? I mean, were stories that come to mind when you think of him? Remy was a, he was a killer human being. He really was. He was a gentle soul. There was not a bad bone in his body, and he was narcoleptic. Like, no, no shit. way, really. No shit, narcoleptic. <laughs> and I used to fuck with him. Oh, no. <laughs> he was such a good dude. But I would take, back then, you know, it was before the digital age, so we all had Polaroids. I have a hundred Polaroids of me putting stuff on his face, <laughs> holding his. I'm, I'm not kidding. He'd be talk, We'd be talking, and he'd. <laughs> did he ever do it on camera? He'd be were sitting you, in the chair. Were you in scenes and he did it on camera? Oh, he did it a couple of times on set. Really? Oh, yes, I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I, I, I would take his hand, put a fork, and I'd f act like feeding and stuff. <laughs> I have a ton of Polaroids like that. Just a wonderful, wonderful human being. And people don't understand it, but he was a huge he was comedian. Big. Oh, was In that? Belgium. Yeah. Oh. Huge comedian. Like, he was far more. And nobody knew who the hell I was. In Europe, every, in, in France, in Belgium, everybody knew who Ronnie Couture was. And he was just a wonderful, wonderful human being. I had, a, I can't say a negative word about the cat. I had a wonderful time playing with him. What's your favorite moment in filming the series? Do you have a, just something that sticks out in your mind, whether it's even on screen or even just behind the camera, remember filming it? Man, I'll tell you, we capsized a steamer, a, a, a steamer at the Tanner River in the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, Crocs left the banks in the water. I'm floating downstream. Uh, that, I remember that. I remember hanging 13 floors inside a spiral staircase in Prague. Um, I remember a, a, a 50 cal machine gun with blanks. I ran in front of it as I was supposed to instructed. Uh, it ripped holes in my pants just from the combustion. Um, there's so many things that happened on Young Indy. I mean, we, it was the wild, wild west. Uh, we were out of the country. We were shooting uh, at, at an incredible pace. I, I, I learned so many things. Uh, it, it, it truly was, it was a wonderful experience. There was harrowing moments. Um, there was injuries. There was, I, I mean, I had to get tested for Belhartsia, you know, any still water near the equ equator. There's a parasitic parasite that can enter your system and kill you in 24 hours. And I, wow. I fell off this boat. It was crazy. Um, we lived in tents for a month in the Congo. Um, I made some amazing friends. The Maasai Mara didn't speak English. They'd never seen video, anything. We were sitting around the campfire. I, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. We landed in Nairobi on an airliner. We took two Twin Otter aircrafts, propeller, three hours, low altitude pass to get the gazelles off of a piece of land, landed, got in land cruisers, four hours to the Tana River, got in canoes. They're not really canoes. They have motors on them. And then another four hours to the Indian Ocean where we set up camp. So we're way away from civilization. Every, all electricity is operated on a generator. And uh, the Maasai Mara that I met that were extras, they'd never seen fire. I, I, they'd never seen video. So I'm sitting around the campfire, I'm filming you know, the fire. And then I had a laptop, not a computer, but a little video player. You'd pop in a full-size VHS and a little five-inch screen, and you could play them the fire. And they'd... <laughs> <laughs> Tell them, you know, touching it, it's not hot. It looks exactly like fire. It's like, 
you know, I traded for, for five Ethiopian crosses, which when you're 17, you have to go out and you have to kill a lion with a spear, a man, and you brand your wife with this Ethiopian cross. You put it in the blood of the, of the lion and you brand your wife. I have five Ethiopian crosses that I traded for two CDs, Jimi Hendrix smash hits <laughs> and Led Zeppelin remasters. <laughs> and I gave them a disc player and about two months of batteries. And the first time that they heard, I remember Crosstown Traffic by Jimi Hendrix. You put the headphones on and you turn it on. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. I mean, j those moments, I tell you, are punctual. And I played hacky sack with them. And they were fucking good. They sucked when they started, and they were <laughs> far better than me by the time that I left them. But leaving with the Ethiopian crosses that I know were such a part of their culture, man, I'll tell you, traveling to 56 different countries, it's meeting so many different people. There was more education in my five years of filming Young Indy than all of my years in elementary school, junior high, high school, and college put together. It was, it, it was those moments that really made it something special. That's cool. That you, were, you were that young and you got that experience that like, no other teenager would like, get that experience, going to so many places. Not, not that young, brother. Not that young. <laughs> I mean, when we, when we first shot it in 91, I was born in 65, so I was 26. <clears throat> oh, when we first started filming, I was already, I was already out of college. I, was, I wasn't a child actor. I was 26 years old and uh, playing, you know, 16 to 22. Um, pros and cons, man, I look like a child in college. I'm not kidding. You know, I, I'm 20 years old by the, by the time I graduate college. And, there's a cute girl, I'm like, hey, what's your name? You're like, oh my God, you're gonna be so cute when you grow up. I'm like, I'm, I'm 20, you're 19. What are you, come on, what, what are you talking about? That was the con, but, uh, but it, it paid off in Hollywood. But yeah, I was 26, so I, I mean, I'd already, I was already an adult, so I was in a position to really absorb it all and appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. The time we have left, thank you so much for the question. The time we have left, we want to make sure uh, we know too. Sean's going to be signing at his table today, yep. so make sure after this panel you go down and say hey and, uh, and meet him at his table. Real quick, we're going to do I'll, I'll skip out and I'll let them say their closing moments, but thank you guys. Your for favorite, favorite moment from Indiana Jones, I want to get that out of you. And any of the films, favorite moment? Oh my God. I, I mean, there, there, was so, there was so many. Fa favorite moment? Probably, you know, look, look we were in the talking about in the Congo. I was walking to set, and they had, they, they, they call them torches in, in England, it's a flashlight. So yeah. So they give you a torch, and you're walking, it's about 200 yards down the Tanner River to get to where the set was, all operating on Jenny's. Um, and my foot hit a crocodile's head. Jeez. And it knocked, <laughs> it knocked me off my feet and scurried, and it didn't want to know part of me, I interrupted it. And it knocked, its head knocked me off my feet and ran into the Tanner River. I mean, that's where we were filming. You know, we were visitors in the, the, the most dangerous part of nature known to man. It's moments like that. I'm not kidding. I, I, when I look back on it, there's, there's moments in Young Indy that I'm blown away that I'm still alive. We shot probably the thing that comes to mind is capsizing the steamer. And you can see the episode. We kept, there's a camera boat. We kept go, going down, turning, turning, and making a U-turn. Camera boat, we're turning towards the camera boat. We did it three times, the tide is going down. We're on a, a radio, Motorola. I said, guys, the, the, the hole is scraping. We're, if we do, the, we, we probably have time for one more. But the tide's dropping. We turn around again and, and it free itself. We need one more. I'm like, guys, this is going to capsize. I mean, the water, it's tilting. Almost the water's coming up to the side. Sure enough, uh, the, the, one of my Masamara friends, his name was Dai, and uh, couldn't swim. And he's in a Belgian army uh, uniform. Uh, we do it the final time, and I'm talking to him on the radio. I'm like, guys, it, the water is up to the, it, it's coming over the, the side of the boat. We do it again, sure enough, flips over. We're all running onto the bottom of the boat, the, 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 running up on the top of the boat. I look down, there's dye in the water. His head's underwater. I jump in the water, I was a lifeguard as a kid. There's no, nothing, nothing heroic, I, he'd have done it for me. But I run around, grab, grab, grab him by the two loops, like, like you have on your shirt. And I pull him back to the boat, put him on, Put him on the, the, the there's a, a like a, 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 it's wooden, but it's a life raft and you can hold on to it. Put him on that and I let go to swim around the other side where the ladder is and suddenly 
the, the boat comes loose because it, the, the top of the boat now was scraping on and it came and it started moving away from me. And on all of the banks, every morning going to set, you see these two knobs sticking up in the water. They're hippos, most territorial animal known to man. Everybody tells you the entire time you're there, don't worry about the crocs, worry about the hippos. If they see you and they can get to you, they will kill you. If they think you're in sight, they will kill you. All of a sudden, that going underwater, coming towards me. All of the banks where you see the crocs sliver into the water. I'm, I, I knew for a fact, I didn't think, I knew for a fact I was gonna be devoured and I was gonna die. And sure enough, here's a camera boat. And I'm, I look behind me, okay, the camera boat's coming, the camera boat's coming, the camera's boom, right past me. <laughs> they didn't see me. I mean, I'm, I'm swimming towards the camera boat because the boat's going away. They go all the way to the boat. Finally, somebody tells them, well, that's Flannery back there. The camera boat comes back and finally picks me up. They didn't get to me, but m moments like that, man. It's like, like we did, we did some, some gnarly things. I remember we charged out of the trenches with real bayonets on real rifles. And no one, it, this was in, in, in Africa, and no one understood the word cut. No one had told them the word cut, and I'm leading the charge. So everybody's charging behind me with sharp, and I'm like, they said cut, they said cut, but I can't stop, I'm gonna get stabbed. They're right behind me charging. We ran for, I don't know, a mile. Before people, you know, they get on the radio and they got a, a, a little car buggy, they're like, stop, 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 stop. Crazy stuff, man, like crazy stuff. They weren't fake bayonets. They're real bayonets on real right. Like you're sprinting and that's a 25 pound instrument you're holding. Like we did some crazy stuff back then, but back then it was all practical. It's what you had to do to get the shot. And I wouldn't have it any different, man. It, it's, I had a ball. It, it's doing all the shit you do as a kid. I got to do it. All the stunts or things that you, you did growing up. You know, if, 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 you know, if you're 14 and somebody said, hey, climb on that train, let's run on the top. Every kid would be like, hell yeah, let's do that. You know, then the, then, you know, the ADs and are like, oh, we can't have you do that. But you're like, I, I did this shit growing up. You know, it's uh, you got an opportunity to live out all those dreams, man. Sean, it, it was an amazing experience. Thank you so much for the memories. Yeah. Uh, Keith, Ron, Mitch, thank you for recounting all of your memories as well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for the Indiana Jones Retrospective. Thank Ross you for Martin being fans. God Carol bless you. Coming up next. Be sure you stick around for that with Captain Powell. Thank you, everybody. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.